For decades now, most doctors have recommended cardio over strength training because they believed it produced more health benefits, stressed the body less, and it was more popular among the public. We now know, though, that strength training has multiple major advantages over cardio. And if you had to pick just one kind of exercise, it should be strength training. That said, there are good reasons to include cardio in your exercise routine as well. First, as the term implies, cardio boosts the health and the function of your cardiovascular system. For instance, while cardio and strength training are about equally effective for reducing blood pressure, research shows that doing both reduces blood pressure the most. Additionally, cardio, but not strength training, helps keep your arteries flexible and responsive to changes in blood flow. And that's why studies show that people who do the most cardio have the supplest arteries. And that is crucial for maintaining healthy blood pressure levels and minimizing stress on your heart and blood vessels. Another circulatory downside to aging is the reduction of the capillary health and density of your muscles and other tissues. And studies show that cardio can significantly increase capillary density, which is the number of capillaries in an area of the body, in muscle tissue in just a few weeks. Cardio also burns substantially more calories per unit of time than strength training does, and that of course can help you lose fat faster and help you keep it off more effectively. Cardio is great for uh, body composition maintenance for that reason. And when you combine strength training and cardio together, and when you combine them, especially in the way that I teach in my new book, Muscle for Life, which you can learn about at Muscle for Life book.com muscle for life book.com you can maximize fat loss without hindering muscle or strength gain so the takeaway here is with moderate sustainable and effective doses of strength training and cardiovascular exercise you can build a body that looks feels and functions like a well oiled machine and cardio is easier to incorporate into your fitness regimen than you may think too. In fact, in Muscle for Life, I share three simple principles that allow you to enjoy most of the benefits cardio has to offer with none of the potential downsides. And again, you can learn all about that book as well as the now it's over $13,000 of cool goodies, fitness goodies that I'm giving away to people who pre-order the book at muscleforlifebook.com. Hello, hello, I'm Mike Matthews, and this is Muscle for Life. Thank you for joining me today. And if you haven't already, please do take a moment to subscribe to the show in whatever app you're listening to me in so you don't miss any new episodes. Uh, they will be queued up for you. And it helps me by boost, by boosting, boosting, by boosting the ranking of the show in the various charts. So this episode was a fun one. This was one of the more... Uh, stimulating conversations I've had recently. In it, I talk with my buddy Menno Henselmans again about a similar topic to our previous discussion, which is the science of self-control and willpower. But this time we talk about dieting in particular. The first discussion that we had, the, the part one, uh, if you will, was more broadly about self-control and willpower because Menno recently released a book on the topic. And I wanted to have him back on to dive into self-control and willpower with dieting. And this episode is chock full of practical tips for improving your diet adherence. This is not just academic theory. Uh, you are going to be a better dieter by the end of this episode, I promise you. And that means losing fat faster and more easily, maintaining your ideal body composition more easily, or even gaining muscle and strength faster and more easily because lean gaining can be similarly difficult to cutting. It's difficult in different ways, but many people struggle 
to successfully lean gain, uh, mostly because they get sick of eating a lot of food and they have the opposite problem of when they're cutting. And all of that is something that Menno is an expert on, not only because he is a veteran evidence-based researcher and writer, and he is also a coach with a lot of experience working with normal everyday people, but Menno also recently released a book called The Science of Self-Control, which is an evidence-based handbook. I think that's the right term because it's very practical. It has over 500 scientific citations, but it is not a dry, complicated textbook. Not that all textbooks are like that, but many textbooks are that give you a lot of theory and then leave it up to you to figure out what to do with all of it. Menno's book is not like that. Menno's book was written with an eye to application, which resonates with me because I try to do that in all of my work. I don't just want to teach people interesting facts. I want to teach people useful things that they can put into application and get good results with. And so in this interview, Menno is going to share a lot of the material that is in his book. He's going to talk about why dieting is inherently difficult, several simple science-based ways to make it easier to stick to a diet, how macronutrient composition, meal timing, and consistency can help or hurt dietary adherence. He talks about cravings, the difference between satisfaction and satiety, tips for eating out and eating off plan, and a whole lot more. And in case you are not familiar with Menno, he has been on my podcast a number of times. He is a former business consultant turned international public speaker, educator, writer, published scientist, and physique coach who is passionate about helping serious athletes attain their ideal performance and physiques. Hey, Menno, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming back and taking your time. My pleasure. Always good to talk. Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, the idea here was to, to kind of make this a, a part two of uh, of our previous talk, which was about your newest book, about mm -hmm. self-control and discipline and willpower. And the first discussion for people listening, if you didn't listen to it, it, you don't have to listen to it, I suppose, for this discussion, but it will provide good context because in that talk, Menno gave some o overarching principles that um, would apply to anything, not just fitness related things. And in this talk though, I thought it would make sense to get into diet, uh, the, the context of diet in particular and how we can use, um, I guess you could say evidence-based strategies and tactics to help with dieting. And a lot of that obviously comes down to compliance, but um, that can start with with design because right some diets are easier to stick to than others and are better in that regard and so yeah that's that's um the the, the general topic for today's discussion and meadow uh i'll just give it to you because i know you uh you have a lot to say on this sure yeah i mean um in my book i go into a lot of, of tips on how to improve diet adherence focusing on willpower and the first important thing probably to realize is that dieting in itself relies on willpower inherently because essentially it's an investment. You are foregoing something now, certain foods that you, you may want or your more primitive brain, your system one, for those that followed the previous talk, uh, once, but you choose not to eat. So if you didn't have hunger and you didn't have these sensations that drive you to eat certain foods, then dieting would be as simple as simply making a choice. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We can't just say, okay, you know, I'm just going to eat broccoli and chicken. And that's it, because you're going to have cravings, you're going to be hungry, you're going to feel restrained and restricted. And interestingly, it's exactly that feeling of being restricted that is the primary problem with dieting, because this is a serious red pill moment for, for those that haven't seen this research. But in research where people are unaware that they are in energy deficits, there are zero cognitive, behavioral, psychological, or sleep-related effects of the diet. In fact, a recent, pretty recent meta-analysis found that the diet-related symptoms or side effects, so troubles with 
concentrating, fatigue, those kind of things, they were unrelated to the degree of weight loss, completely unrelated, meaning people that were not actually losing weight at all. So they were trying, but failing. So they were actually at energy maintenance, not an energy deficit. And they still had the same number of side effects, the same problems. Whereas in, for example, military personnel, where they just have rations and they don't know how much they're eating, or in experiments where people eat modified gels, so they have no idea of what, what, what they're eating. Uh, they just know it's a certain amount of gel that has a certain flavor. And one group has basically maintenance energy intake, and the other group consumes essentially zero calories. And you can do that for several days, and there are no differences when you unleash a battery of psychological and cognitive testing on these people. Like they perform equally well on IQ tests, reaction times, uh, their mood states. They also, they can't tell in these kind of experiments whether they were in the diet group or not. But if you contrast that with most people's experience with dieting, it's a completely different world, right? Because almost everyone that I've talked to thinks dieting has some negative effects on how they feel. So it's, it's that feeling of restriction, knowing that you're dieting. That is a key part of the problem. And that is also the feeling of being restricted and having to give up certain things and making choices. That is the biggest problem with dieting. Now, may, you know, maybe in contest prep, when you actually get near starvation levels lean, then maybe we can talk physical effects. But for most people, people that just want like, you know, decent six pack uh, and not like crazy contest shape, most of the effects of dieting are not physical effects of the dieting, they're mental effects, they're in the brain. So that, that is the foundation of, of everything, I think, realizing that first. That's interesting. And, you know, that makes me think of the last uh, little cut that I did, which was during, so it was maybe six months, four to six months of last year. When, when the first round of lockdowns first began. And so I couldn't go to the gym and I was at home doing home workouts and I wasn't driving to the office or to the gym. And so it's like, yeah, I'll just take that time and I'll just do some cardio and I'm not going to change anything about how I'm eating though. And it was, it was very easy. And I, I mean, I, I guess there's a caveat in that I, I can't say that I've ever had a particularly rough time of cutting, but I have had cuts where I, I do start to notice it. And um, the the end point of this previous cut, which did not feel like a diet at all, and of course I was eating the foods I like to eat, but 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 that point of making no change to my diet probably helped make it even easier. When all I did is just increase my activity level, eat exactly the same in a calorie deficit, but f- had no, I would have known it. It, all I noticed is I just got a little bit leaner, a little bit leaner until eventually I was like, okay, I guess I'm pretty lean now and I'll just stop here. And that end point was comparable to previous cuts. I've gotten, I got pretty lean. Um, it's hard to say exactly, but maybe somewhere between eight and 10% where, uh, I think that's where most guys like to mm-hmm. be for looking good. And, um, but in previous cuts where the, the diet was a little bit more aggressive and I guess, um, the, the, the perception of it was a little bit different. It, it did, it, it did feel a bit harder. Yeah, definitely. And I think what, what you have is what mo- most people should aspire to. I think that is sort of the, the idea of being successful at dieting is when you can diet at libitum, you know, without necessarily tracking everything that you eat, you just know what kind of foods are good for you and you eat them until you're satiated. And then, you automatically essentially lose fat and you just stop when you're happy with how you look in the mirror. That is, I think, the the ideal endpoint for most people. When you get so good at dieting and and in particular managing your appetite that you can just get to that point. And then for many people and myself too, cutting is actually easier than bulking. Yeah. Because when bulking, you have to be more meticulous. You can just, you know, just dream or bulk and eat whatever you want. You get fat. And if you eat your regular food choices that, or at least probably for us regular, that you, you don't end up in energy surplus anymore. So you, you probably need more tracking. 
And I think for or a lot maybe of the that's... flip side is you just eat more of the stuff you normally eat. Like if I were to do that, I probably would. I like to eat oatmeal at night. Like, all right. So it's usually about mm-hmm. a cup dry, cut it, put some nuts and fruit in it. All right, fine. That turns into maybe two cups or that's probably the way I would. I haven't done a, a lean bulk in a while because I don't really see the purpose in it because I'm not going to really gain much of anything anyway. I'll just get mm-hmm. fatter. Um, but that's probably how I would approach it. Yeah. And that only works to a certain point though. Mm. Especially if you have an adaptive metabolism. Mm. For me, you know, when I end the cut at like 2,000 calories, and then I have, for the bulk, I have to go up to 4,000 and above it very quickly. Well, I'm already eating a lot of food true. at that point at 2,000 calories. So I, I definitely cannot double that. <laughs> true, true. That is the last time I, I was lean gaining. I had to end, I was around maybe 4,300. And for me, probably similar to you that feels i was force feeding myself basically i mean i it mm-hmm. was the the final meal of the day in particular i mean it's fine i did it but i didn't enjoy it at all like i could have stopped eating probably at noon and would have been totally fine with that i wouldn't have gotten hungry again for the rest of the day yeah me too when i go over about 95 kilos i'm, I'm force feeding now i could easily do it if i started eating junk food but i have a sort of mantra for myself to only eat healthy food Hmm. or nutritious food that has no adverse health effects, let me put it that way. And yeah, it just, it's, it's basically a luxury problem, you know, because of course uh, it it is, it is a problem, but on the other hand, you can just stay leaner and then your appetite's higher because the leaner you are, the higher your appetite always naturally is because you have lower leptin levels. So it's definitely the focus for almost everyone I think should be on how to get lean in a very sustainable, low effort fashion. And then if you have, if you're one of the individuals that actually has the luxury problem of having difficulty with bulking, then, you know, you can sort of use some of these tips in reverse. And, um, but mostly for a lot of people, it's like, you know, okay, you have 600 calories that you need to fill in, eat a chocolate bar, you know, done. (laughs) Yep. Peanut butter sandwiches. Okay. Oh, you're, you're still eating lean, uh, dairy. Well, let's make it full fat. Mm-hmm. Oh, lean meat, let's make it full fat meat. I see egg whites in there. We can use whole eggs. And also fruits and vegetables. Yeah, eat a lot less of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't need that much of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to I get back to um, the, 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 the plan topic. But, but you said something that I'm just curious, and, and I want to hear your thoughts on regarding, you said it's a, it's a mantra of yours to, to stick to nutritious foods or foods that don't have any adverse uh, uh, health effects. Uh, I'm curious what you mean exactly by that. Yeah, basically a diet that and, and why. Awesome. I'm just because it sounds like mm-hmm. you are uh, just just based on the comments you made that uh, I'm sure you're you're probably not against having some chocolate every day, for example. But um, it sounds like you will only allow so much of that, as opposed to some mm-hmm. people are somewhere. Maybe they're not full IIFYMs, so to speak. Uh, mm-hmm. But but. You know, and, and I, I've run across a lot of these people in the gym too, that they don't, they don't eat very much fruits and vegetables ever, period, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talk about, I have, I have um, in the book as well, by the way, if it's your macros, uh, it's another interesting topic we can touch on. But for me, I basically optimize the health of my diet because I, I want optimal health. I just like, uh, you know, uh, exercise both mentally and physically for me is a way to make the best version of myself I can be. And health health is a big part of that. And I'm also actually very sensitive uh, to changes in uh, diet. Because I, for example, for a period, I actually tried, what if I still eat mostly whole foods, but for example, I don't pay attention to the fatty acid ratio of my diet. And that ended up me basically eating just saturated fat. And then my blood lipids actually skyrocketed. They were really bad, (laughs) very quickly. So LDL super high. Yeah. LDL super high. That in particular, yeah. HDL was low. So I actually have to pay attention to this. And I also have, uh, I think it's just hereditary factors. Like uh, I have sort of WASP genes, if you will, which uh, most people have a a hereditary predisposition for high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And that's definitely the case for me. So it's also relevant. And some clients I know can, uh, you know, use more like the 80, 20 rule where it's like 20% uh, relative junk in their diet, at least when they're bulking, and it's co- everything is completely fine. But for me, I actually see a difference in blood work. So I definitely are on the side of uh, 
just making everything as healthy as possible. When Plus, do you feel a difference? Because a lot of people don't get they don't get blood work done, so they wouldn't they wouldn't know unless mm -hmm. uh, there, there's something that they notice. Like it could be worse uh, digestion, it could be worse sleep, it could be brain fog. Yeah, I think digestion is probably the thing that people notice first, but there are a lot of adverse health effects that people don't readily notice. Yeah. yeah. In fact, if you if you take a bunch of people out of the population at random then almost all of them will have at least one micronutrient deficiency. And it's hard to pinpoint for them, like what causes it? Because it's, it's, some, it's something that creeps up over time and occurs gradually. And you just get used to feeling a certain way. And you don't know that that way is suboptimal. That, that's what is, is so insidious about any non-optimum state, whether it's a mm -hmm. mental state or, or a physical state or being in a shitty relationship i mean is is just how yeah. easily we can adapt to shitty circumstances and COVID. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and just go well this is the new normal now mm -hmm. and then and then if if you are able to to break through and fix it then of course we've all had that experience where we look back and and then we realize how bad it was before and we then wonder how we ever put up with it it's just one of those it seems to be perennially human things that we all have to struggle with definitely and with dieting sleep uh, that's that very very much the case like if you look back on you know your first diets like oh <laughs> that was bad yeah it's true it's true so let's segue back to dieting and so okay so we have this uh this framework here uh this mental framework which is is probably news to a lot of people listening because i know a lot of people they think that even even a mild calorie deficit within a week you have all of these physiological things that start happening metabolic adaptation and it's just it's it's uh it's a very slippery slope and if you don't take a diet break every four weeks you are just going to feel miserable etc etc and mm -hmm. um so if if let's just let's just uh, accept your your i mean obviously it's not your but let's accept this 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 proposition that you put forward which is for a lot of people who are looking to go from out of shape to in shape or probably even some people who are pretty in shape who want to get really in shape maybe something comparable to what i was talking about my little covid cut um and and if most of the major obstacles are going to be I guess maybe a word could be psychogenic or just it's more psychosomatic than it is actually mm -hmm. physical. What are some some things we can do to make that process uh, to make that process easier to to stop our mind from messing with us so much? Uh, a lot of it comes down to well, basically, when you realize that the problems are the restriction and the the, the feelings associated with that, and having to make choices you don't like in your diet. A big part of it, other than realizing in the first place, you're not actually becoming healthier, you're actually becoming a lot healthier. Like objectively, almost every health biomarker improves in energy deficit, even up to really, really lean levels. So other than that and realizing that, there is a big part of successful dieting revolves around not feeling restricted and restrained. And you can do that, for example, with successful appetite management so that you don't uh, you can eat as much as you want. You don't, you're not hungry because hunger is, you always feel restricted when you're hungry and you can't eat more. And reducing choices, not thinking about food. I think one of the, the biggest problems a lot of people have when they're dieting, and in particular people that are very serious about fitness, is that they obsess the crap out of their diet. And that only makes things worse because dieting is like sleep. If you obsess too much over your sleep, you're only making it worse. <laughs> and with dieting as well, you're, you're, you're not going to make your diet any better if every day and new you're, you're trying to tinker things and trying to optimize things because there's just there's a range of basically optimal. You know, for, for most people, you can mix a lot of different diets that are all resulting in similar uh, effects, both for your physique and health. So it's not like there's the one optimal magical number. Plus, there's actually a lot of research that shows that variation itself is detrimental, not just for, for diet adherence, but also for our mood and our cognitive functioning. For example, researchers have looked at the effect of changing the size of a meal that people are used to at a certain time of day. For example, at lunch, you're used to a 500 calorie meal, and then some days they give them a thousand calorie meal, and the other group just eats 500. And they can also do it at breakfast, blah, blah, blah. And then they see if you eat a meal that's different, very different, not like 100 calories, but very different in size than you're used to, 
And also if it has different macronutrient composition, like very different, if you go from keto to high carb, you actually have a worse mood typically and cognitively you perform worse. So things like reaction time might deteriorate. If you do a testing, like IQ testing, you'll probably perform a bit worse on IQ test after an unusual meal. And in general, one of the biggest predictors of successful dieting is consistency in everything. People that are very consistent, even if it's not necessarily optimal, but they're doing things very consistently right, th those people are much, much more successful than other people. And if you realize that fully, then you can also see why I'm, I'm not a big proponent of things like if it fits your macros in the sense of having a new meal plan every single day. Uh, I like the principle even worse of that. on the fly every day mm -hmm. thinking, all right, what do I want to eat for lunch? And then searching calories and macros. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. Maybe I can, you know, what about that? All right. What if I cut that in half and <laughs> like that stuff? Yes, definitely. Yeah. And diet breaks also not a fan. Any, any kind of very dramatic cycling or changes in the diets that do not have a very clear purpose. You have to be very wary of because if you can just make things very simple and basically make you know, the road to success, the path of least resistance and make the, the path that you're on the, def the default, the, the best possible option. So, for example, if you do meal planning and you have a fridge full of food and you already know, OK, lunchtime, I put this, this Tupperware box in the microwave. This is my meal. Like that's the default. And then if you don't think at all, you don't make any choices, you just follow the plan, then you're going to be successful. Whereas if you don't have a meal plan and you have to think, Okay, what am I going to eat? And especially when you're hungry, it's the worst possible time to actually have to make those choices. It's much, much more difficult for yourself. Absolutely. And, and so what are some of these key points you mentioned? Um, consistency. Wh what, are, what are some of the key aspects of consistency that, that matter the most? Like I, could, I, can, I can hear people wondering, well, is it, is it consistency of meal time? Is that the key or should, is it, is it the calories or is it the macros? Is it the food choices or is it a bit of everything? Basically everything. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's remarkably, uh, or it's remarkable how much consistency matters in, in like every single field, like macronutrient composition of the diet, the size of your habitual meals has been found to play a role. Nutrient timing, uh, as in consistency of meal times. There was actually just a recent study that confirmed what I wrote also in the book, that if you have your meals at irregular times, the thermic effect of food is actually significantly lower. Like it's not hundreds of calories, but based on the estimates from the two best studies that we have, you're looking at a 5 to 10% difference possibly in total daily energy intake in people that have their meals at the same time versus people that have different times every day. And that's, you know, that's, that could be the difference between maintaining and being in, in a successful cut. And you mentioned that um, when we are getting leaner, we are getting healthier. I, I could see that as something that, that many people, they had to, wait, did he say, was that, did he mean the other way around? Because again, many people, especially, especially if mm -hmm. somebody is, is already looking fit, uh, it's obvious if somebody's very overweight and they're going to a healthy body comp, let's say, let's say a guy at 15% body fat, that's eh, totally fine. He's going to look fine, fit, healthy, but to go from 15% to 10% is, is and in women, let's call it 25 to 20. That's probably often considered, uh, not a healthy process. And then, and then I know some people will say even, well, being at 10% or 20 as a woman is, is, is generally less healthy than 15 or 25. Yeah, that's, that's definitely false. Like that's objectively false. So it, there is definitely an argument to be made when you're talking about like, 5% and 15% for men and women, respectively. But mm, 10 I've, never and 20, been, I've never been to 5%. Maybe you have, but uh, most people been, listening. Yeah, probably I've been close, about probably. That. Like, I've had nutriations for my last contest. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, then, then you, you definitely don't feel good. <laughs> but for most people, if you objectively look at their, their health biomarkers, and you can literally do this yourself. Like, if you're 15% body fat as a guy, 25% as a woman, do your blood work. Don't change anything in your diet in terms of general food choice and everything. Lose like 5% body fat, go to the doctor again. You'll find your resting heart rate's probably lower. Your cholesterol profile's probably better. Your level of insulin resistance is almost certainly lower. The only thing that might deteriorate is your anabolic hormone levels. And 
Do you think that'll be meaningful though? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, as long as they don't go below the physiological range, which they might at some point in contest prep, but they shouldn't at like 10% body fat for a guy or 20 as a woman. It's actually debatable if that's really going to affect longevity because hormone replacement therapy, for example, in uh, elderly individuals and postmenopausal women does not seem to affect all cause mortality. It has some pros, it has some cons. Hmm. So there might be slightly elevated risk of cancer and certain types of cardiovascular conditions, other types of cardiovascular conditions are less likely to occur. So, you know, sex hormone levels seem to be, they definitely increase well-being, but they don't really seem to affect longevity and all cause mortality, in the sense, which means like your total risk of dying from anything, basically. And what are your thoughts about macronutrient composition in, in the context of, of dieting? Many people um, that reach out to me, they understand high protein. There's, there's a little argument about that. But then I, I see a lot of people put a lot of attention on carb versus fat and what's the ideal. Yes. Should, should it be 40-40-20? Should it be 40-30-30? Uh, and so on. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thing with the, uh, the old flexible dieting range where there has been a major de-emphasis on food choices, but a huge emphasis on macronutrients. And I think a lot of people are actually quite obsessed with their macronutrients and they think of their foods. You ask them, like, what are you going to eat? Like carbs. Like, <laughs> you don't eat carbs, okay? You, you eat a certain food. You're eating like potatoes or rice. It's like protein or, or fat, you know? Because there, there, there are huge differences. In, uh, in any kind tasty, of tasty carbs? What do you mean? Yeah. 50 grams, what do you want? I mean, if you say fat, does that mean you're you're drinking oil or you're eating an avocado or, you know, there's a huge difference in, beef, in effects. Yeah. yeah and, and exactly. Is it is, is fatty beef? Is that protein or fat? Like, what about nuts? They're high, yeah, in, or, high or both eggs, carbs and right. fat and protein. Yeah, exactly. So in any case, that, that focus on macronutrients is definitely misplaced in the sense of, in the context of diet adherence. And in fact, in, in most contexts, actually. Especially when you're talking minor differences, there, there really aren't any effects. And also in the book, I review the research on what kind of the, the optimal diet is. And you basically find as long as you're consistent, it doesn't really matter. There are a few principles, like high protein works, but high protein means at least 1.6 gram per kilogram per day. Above that, you again, don't really see more effects. Super low fat and super low carb, but especially low fat does not work. Like zero fat diets, you see this a lot in competitors, works fine for a couple of weeks, maybe even months, and then you completely burn out typically. Uh, unless you're on gear, then it's, it's not as bad because you, you know, if you get your hormones from a needle, you don't need fat to make your body produce them itself. And super um, low carb, like keto, carnivore, shows some trends to be worse in the long run. But I think that's mostly because people have a very difficult uh, time it, implementing them properly, especially in research. You know, a lot of people think keto is drinking olive oil. Then, no, it's more like eating avocado. You're still eating vegetables. Keto is also not about minimizing carb intake. So I think that's more, you know, wrong implementation, getting micronutrient deficiencies and the like, rather than really necessarily suffering from the lack of carbs. So the most, most important thing, again, is, is by far just getting the basics right of your diet and then being consistent and other than that, food choices are actually far more predictive of long-term diet success than macronutrient composition of the diet. Like if someone's still eating ice cream and pizza, then you can fit those things into your diet if you're tracking your energy intake. But even that up to a point is simply not sustainable. Like if I want to eat a thousand calories of pizza or ice cream, and at some point in my diet, I have to go to 2000 calories a day, I'm going to be super, super hungry. And nobody gets successful long run being hungry every day. So it's, it's theoretically viable, like, you know, in physical terms, as long as you're eating 2000 calories, you can fit some pizza in there. But behaviorally speaking, it's not. And you also get into the problem that if you eat a little bit of pizza, but you can't satiate yourself with pizza anymore, it can only result in further cravings. And, and that's why, for example, take ice cream for me, I eat ice cream if I'm maintaining, which I, that's what I've been doing for some time now. Mm -hmm. I like to have it once a week, unless I'm going to be eating at a restaurant or something, but I, but 
I don't really like eating ice cream unless I eat a lot of it. Like for me, having 100, 200 calories yes. of ice cream, it's just not enjoyable at all. I'd rather just not do it. I'd rather actually just eat some oatmeal with some nuts and fruit. So if I'm going to eat ice cream, I want to eat the whole pint. And uh, the brand I currently like is this brand called Jenny's and that's a thousand calories a pint. And so mm -hmm. I'll do that once a week. Uh, but that's just, that's just once a week. I'm, I'm, I don't nibble on the ice cream every day. Cause I know that even if I have good, a good relationship with food and good discipline, I'm still going to want to eat more and it's just going to be annoying. So my little daily treat, if I want to have something is just some dark chocolate. Cause I don't have to eat much of that at all. And I, and it's, and it just, I like it. I, I, I can have just a square or two and be like, oh, that that's nice. Not the case with ice cream. So going to your mm -hmm. point of food choices, uh, I think it, if I'm hearing you right, people, uh, they, they need to understand what works for them. That's not the case. I mean, I know people who they can eat five spoons of ice cream and feel, Hey, I, that was great. They can put it away. That's not me though. Yeah. And for, for a lot of people, it's not, even though they think it is <laughs> so a lot of people think, you know, I just eat a little bit of this and portion control in general seems to be short-term successful for some people, but long-term really does not do well. So all that stuff goes right out the window when people get really lean and muscular, which massively increases your appetite. And if you just eat a little bit, it just, it increases the craving. So I think that's, that's one of the biggest myths also in terms of diet adherence, the idea that you satiate a craving and then it's gone. Like it, it does not work. Um, then there, there are numerous studies on this, like literally, I think at least a dozen, where they show that not eating a food reduces the craving for that food. And as long as you keep indulging in the food, you keep fueling the craving. And it doesn't even matter how much you eat. So if you eat a little bit of ice cream, you fuel the craving just as much as if you eat a lot. In fact, in large, in large portions, it can be better to eat a lot, especially if you get nauseous, because then you get a negative food association. Yeah. <laughs> so th these are all things that work well when appetite really isn't a problem yet. But you see typically that when they get leaner, more muscular, and those things don't, don't work anymore. And there's a lot of research showing that there are some tricks that you can implement it, like ice cream, for example. There's research on chocolate cravings, which shows if you indulge in the craving a little bit after you're already satiated, it induces far less, um, far fewer cravings than if you eat the chocolate first or on an empty stomach, which makes sense, right? Because then if you eat it afterwards, you're basically, you're already full and you just have a little bit purely for the taste. But if you eat it really to, to eat, to, to satiate yourself, then um, you're going to feel restricted because you can't eat the whole thing. That's a great point. And uh, that's something that I've, I've always done. Uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't realize that, that it's an evidence-based way to manage cravings, but I've always tacked whatever little thing I want to have. It's always been, I mean, for me, it's, it's almost always after dinner, uh, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a meal unto itself. I'm not going to have a 3 p.m. snack of just like half of a chocolate bar or something. Did you know that right now I am in the middle of a big book launch bonanza for my new fitness book for men and women of all ages and abilities, Muscle for Life, which is releasing on January 11th and is currently available for pre-order over at Muscle for Life book.com muscle f o r life book.com and why should you pre-order well to invoke an electrochemical response in your brain and stimulate something approximating joy i am celebrating the release of this new book by giving away over twelve thousand dollars of glorious fitness goodies including a bowflex c6 bike that's a thousand bucks a hypervolt go that's 200 bucks an instant pot duo crisp air fryer another 200 bucks a vitamix e310 blender 350 bucks a 30 minute zoom call with yours unruly and that is priceless of course and much much more now there are several ways to enter to win too you can buy books you can spread the word you can follow me on social media and more so again to get all of the giveaway sauce go over to muscleforlifebook.com muscleforlifebook.com yeah the order in which you eat foods actually has very significant effects on diet adherence in research uh, and in my book i use the analogy of eating uh, sushi with traditional japanese order and there the order is that you start with the, the least flavorful or most 
sort of mundane kind of foods, like the miso soup and amame, the white fish, and then you move up to more flavorful and more fatty kinds of fish. And that, that order is very successful uh, for two reasons. One is that if you start with the fatty stuff, then you actually just induce the craving and then you switch to the other stuff. You don't want it anymore. Like you don't want soup anymore when you've just already started eating ice cream, right? But if you eat soup first, when you're hungry, you actually might like the soup. And then later on, you're going to be content with far less ice cream. And because you're basically filling up your, your appetite units with lean foods, you reduce the total energy intake of the meal a lot. And there's also one thing that's, I think, very important to realize. Research very consistently finds that meal satisfaction is completely unrelated to energy intake. Like a lot of people think, especially if they go to a buffet, that they get the most satisfaction when they try the most things and they eat a lot. But that's not true. Like satisfaction is a psychological phenomenon. It's the brain registering satiety mostly. Like you have a certain in emotion or in this case a feeling that which is mostly hunger. And if you can satiate that emotion, like literally satiate yourself in this case of hunger, then the brain creates positive emotions basically because it's, it's mission accomplished. But the brain does not have a system where it's like, oh, we need this amount of calories. It's actually with, with dieting, there are a lot of things where the brain is not that um, smart, evolutionary speaking, or it's, it's even smarter if you look at the even bigger picture than, than we think. So there are a lot of ways you can manipulate and trick the brain into being satiated or satisfied in general much earlier with a certain type of meal. And and something that is probably worth mentioning just to just to to carry that uh, on is research showing that the amount of food volume that you eat has more to do with satiety than than the calories. Yes, and that's a, I think a, a useful tip. When I mean to that point, I can eat a big vegetable dinner. I just call it vest, vegetable slop that I've been eating forever. Talk about consistency. I think two years now, I basically have the same dinner every, uh, call it Monday through Thursday, maybe Monday through Friday, or even on the weekends, if my family's out of town or whatever. And it's just a bunch of vegetables, some meat, some, it's like, it's like a bastardized, uh, Frankenstein stir fry. And I don't, I, at one point, I probably worked out the calories, um, just to have an understanding of my overall calorie intake. Um, but, it's certainly not a high calorie meal, but it's very filling and it's very satisfying. Even when I'm hungry, even though it is just really a bunch of vegetables, it's probably like five to six servings of vegetables just in one go with meat. Yeah, it's perfect. I mean, I have a lot of things like that too. Uh, a lot of soups that I really like. Soups are great. Yeah. I think a, a lot of people that are very successful with dieting, if you look at what they actually eat, it's very consistent. They, I often joke that in large part, the key to successful dieting is simply finding like four keeper recipes. Hmm. And if you, you found those, then you're basically set. For, for example, I had one, one client, which he did not realize, but he actually loved zucchini. And I gave him a zucchini soup recipe and he made that. And he was like, this is amazing. And then he started implementing zucchini and everything, made, zo made zoodles. <laughs> and that, that basically, that, that one thing, was for him the difference between struggling massively with dieting. And since then, he literally said, like a week later, I think I have permanently solved the, the dieting issue. Because he could just eat loads of zucchini. Whenever he wants to lose fat, just eat loads of zucchini. <laughs> Done. <laughs> you, that, that was it. The you zucchini know, he, he diet. Loved it. There's a, yeah, he, he loved a fat it. Diet zucchini is super nutritious, super satiating. So he never had problems anymore with um, consuming fewer calories. That was just it. That was like the one golden thing he needed. And, and I understand that. I mean, uh, i trying to think. I guess I, I really like Brussels sprouts. So I eat them every day. I eat zucchini as well. That goes into my mm -hmm. slop. But um, and, and everybody listening, I'm sure, can immediately think of some nutritious, relatively low-calorie food that you just really like. And especially if you find the right recipe, right? And there are so many different ways to prepare things. It's hard to, to not be able to find something like that. Like maybe the guy seems like he's, he's a little bit lucky in that he just loves yeah. zucchini just pounds zucchini all day in five different ways and he loves it. All right, fine. Maybe, maybe that doesn't work for, for, for a lot of people, but what about three things and what about just three, you know, go tos? And I think that's a great tip. Definitely. Yeah. What about meal timing? Yeah. For diet adherence, again, consistency is the most important thing. Hmm. Research on appetite generally finds, including a recent meta-analysis, that the sweet spot is typically 
uh, around three or four meals. Most people do worse. Funny enough, the, the old bodybuilding idea was that you need six, it's better. But I think almost everyone has, has found for themselves, it's actually really hard when you get to low energy intakes to have six meals because you just have tiny, tiny meals and there isn't a single meal of the day that really satiates you. So most people, I think, are best off with three or four. Two might actually be good for some people in terms of uh, diet adherence, but it's most likely suboptimal for muscle growth slash retention. So I wouldn't uh, experiment with that unless it's, it's a lot easier for you diet adherence-wise and you don't care about maximizing muscle mass. And, and what about eating out? I know that's uh, something I get asked about fairly often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, there are a, lot of, a lot of good things you can do. Uh, to minimize the damage there. Um, the food order tip that we discussed, like starting with the least flavorful options, having your protein and fiber first in particular, that's really important because then you're also in a position to make much more rational choices. Another tip from uh, recent studies is that starting with something with an umami flavor and free glutamate, like mushrooms or um, tomatoes, actually increases self-control and lowers energy intake because the free glutamate seems to affect uh, glutamate receptors in the mouth that subsequently uh, enhance self-control and lower energy intake. One of those things that um, MSG in, in soups for, has, is what research actually originally started with. And they found that it, it, it works. Like it's actually um, a, a significant diet adherence booster to have an artificial flavor enhancer in your food. <laughs> That's ironic. Is, yeah, pretty, um, pretty crazy. Uh, but that, that's... You know, that's one of those tips that's like uh, almost too good to be true, but it actually works. And another thing, I think the, the thing that most people do wrong is they save up calories by basically starving themselves before they go out. And you should think of it as you're going to eat foods that have a higher energy density than the foods you normally eat. So you have a certain amount of appetite units. And if you're going to fill them with those foods you're going to end up with a far higher energy intake than otherwise. Which means that if you starve yourself and then you're going to pig out on pizza and ice cream, you're going to do heinous damage. Whereas if you show up already satiated, which is actually what I recommend for a lot of people, actually at home, first eating a soup, for example, first eating a big bowl of tomato or zucchini soup, and then you show up to the barbecue or wherever else you're going, then for one, you're not starving, so you can make much more rational decisions. And you can just eat the food for flavor rather than having to satiate yourself with those high energy density foods. So it's much more effective to switch to very lean foods, like just eating like uh, your filler recipe with a lot of vegetables, lean protein sources, saving up calories, but not starving yourself rather than just saying what a lot of people do in my experience is, for example, oh, I'm going out to eat. I'm going to, I'm going to skip the meal beforehand. And that is not only not effective, it's actually directly counterproductive because you're going to have more appetite at the uh, cheap meal. Makes sense. And and that's something, a mistake I'm sure you've, I've, I've made many times in the past. And yep. I, I, what I found my way to, and this is, this is what I would say I have most recently recommended is uh, I don't mind saving up calories, but to your point, I'm going to eat probably most of my protein for the day. I'm probably going to have some fruit, some vegetables. I'm going to eat some, some, the, I'm not going to come into the meal having only eaten a couple hundred calories. So I can like, Oh, I have 3000 calories to eat in this meal. I'm going to, I'm going to come into it. Um, not, not any hungrier than I would normally feel for let's call it a dinner, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to eat enough food and enough of the right foods to make sure that uh, I feel more or less normal. And and then and then uh, I don't restrict myself at the meal, but I also I've learned to not. Uh, and this is probably something that um, you, you might even have in the back of your mind to mention as well that I've I've learned that uh, you don't have to. I think of Thanksgiving, which is coming up, where in the past, just for fun, basically, I would eat like seven plates of food to the point where it was mm -hmm. actually painful. I'm on the couch, can't move, sweating. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of fun, you know, at like plate three. And then I, I kept going because yeah, it tasted good. But uh, I, have, I have learned that you get most of the satisfaction just eating to the point of, of satiety and uh, no more hunger. And I've tasted everything enough. And then just stopping there, you know? Yeah, there, there's good research on this where 
people have sort of a satiety sweet spot. And a quote I often like to mention is from Louis C.K., where he says, the meal is not over when I'm full. The meal is over when I hate myself. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that was my old Thanksgiving uh, routine. Yeah. So I think for, for a lot of people, it's really good to have this framework that satiety is, happens on a continuum. Like there are certain points where you're starving. And also good to realize for, for diet adherence, by the way, if you're really hungry and someone's like, there's a saying in the Netherlands, actually, if you're really hungry, then raw beans will taste sweet to you. So if you think like, oh, I would love some beans right now, then you're actually hungry. But if you're like, no, I don't think I'll have beans. Ice cream, though, I think I can go for some ice cream. Then you're not really hungry. Then you're just craving pleasure, basically. And that is a really important distinction also for yourself to note, because that's what I call the two S's of diet adherence. You have to be satiated and satisfied. And those things have different kind of things you can do for them. And by with this simple test, you basically know if your problem at the moment is actual satiety or satisfaction, which is more psychological. Where was I originally going? Uh, uh, well, we were talking about the, this idea of coming into coming into a, a restaurant meal, for example, being being satiated. Right, right. The satiety spectrum. And then so, so yeah. So I guess I'm guessing what you're like. Okay, you've kind of checked off the the satiety. Now you can you can go to that meal and just chase the satisfaction and not have to also try to get satiety from it. Right, and with fullness on the other side of the spectrum, there's also um, a, a sweet spot that you should be aware of where. Like you say, you can be at a certain point, you're full and you don't need food anymore, but you can keep eating. And at certain points, if you keep eating, it actually makes you worse off. Like it's every single bite just hurts. It doesn't provide any more pleasure. You're already full. All it does is it causes pain. So it, it's really good to realize that the goal is not to eat as much as possible. And I myself for sure have made this mistake before where if you just go into the meal of the idea of eating as much as you can because you felt so deprived beforehand. And it really is not. The goal of the meal is to satiate yourself and to be happy and have a pleasurable experience. And there is a certain sweet spot there that you just need to cross and you don't need, to, you don't need more than that. On the other hand, it's also very good to realize that you do need to be satiated because long-term hunger is not sustainable for anyone. And research generally finds that men prefer to be a bit higher on the, the continuum um, than women. Women are generally a bit more okay with being, you know, just full, but maybe still having some idea of, I could eat more, but I don't want to. Whereas men typically want to be more on the end of, I'm really full, I'm very completely satiated. Um, I could eat more, but it would definitely not be pleasurable anymore. So it is good to realize that you do want to be full, right? Because a lot of people also think, oh, I just eat a little bit and I'll be hungry. No, you definitely can't be hungry but you also don't have to pig out and actually make it unpleasant. So yeah, that, that I think is a really important mindset to have. And one other thing that you mentioned uh, in the book is, and I think this is a, this is a good tip is, okay, so you're going to have your, your cheat meal or treat meal or whatever, and you're going to go out for it. And okay, so you overdo it. And uh, you would prefer that somebody overcompensates the following day as opposed to, or let's say they just know that what they're going to go eat, it's going to be a lot of calories. It just is what it is, right? Um, you're going to go eat the 2000 calorie pizza and you're going to have some ice cream after. And that's what you want to do. Okay, fine. Um, you have two options. You could starve yourself leading up to it, right? Which we already talked about and why that's a bad idea. Um, and, or, or you could even, let's say, eat to satiety, go into it, but you still are going to eat what you're going to eat. It's going to happen. But then the following day, is it okay uh, to eat quite a bit less to get rid of maybe some of that previous day's surplus? It can be. Like, theoretically, it is. And if you're extra motivated at that point, that's the reason I think it's better to compensate afterwards than beforehand. Because if you compensate beforehand, you run into the problems that we just discussed. Yeah. You just make you know the overeating worse. If you compensate afterwards you're probably more motivated to do it. So that's good. On the other hand, most research finds it's much more important to focus on the long run and to simply reflect on why did you overeat and was it worth it? That's a really, really important question to ask yourself. And also especially to do body composition measurements at the end of the week or even day if you overeat a lot and see, was there a noticeable fat gain? Did I not lose fat compared to, you know, I was supposed to lose fat? And then reflect on, 
was this worth it? And you can of, often quantify things as, okay, this was a week of dieting gone in a single meal. Mm. And then you may think, okay, that maybe that was worth it, but maybe it was not. And it is good to actually make that, ref, that reflection objectively based on data. Now, other than that, it's much more important to focus on long-term habits and routines and just following your meal plan. Because if the next day you already had trouble with the diet and you have to change your meal plan to compensate for that one day of overeating and you may end up hungry and you're going to obsess about food again, it's better to just stick with the plan and learn from the mistakes, if there were any, and continue as planned. Because it really, in the long term, those, those single events, those aren't going to make or break things. But habits, routines, and long-term sustainability, those definitely will. Makes sense. And, and something I will add to that, just in my experience, is this is, this is me and it doesn't necessarily, necessarily apply to everybody. I've found, again, I, I'm generally in maintenance mode. Sometimes I do a little bit of cutting, uh, but I'm generally in, in maintenance mode. And if I eat a lot and, and it's, it's, it, it was my plan to go eat a lot. And so I would say, is it worth it? Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. That was the plan. And I, I didn't go to the point of hating myself, but I was in a, a nice surplus for the day. What I've found is it, it's quite easy to eat a bit less the following day because uh, I, I'm usually not very hungry. Like in the morning, um, if I eat a sizable dinner, quite a bit more than calories than I normally would in food I would normally eat, uh, I, I am not very hungry in the morning at all. So I could just skip breakfast basically. And uh, and then and then that, that also then carries on really through the rest of the day where uh, and I totally agree with you. I could just not and not care at all and move on with my life. That's totally fine. But because psychologically, physiologically, it's very easy for me to just eat less the next day. I just do that. Like, all right, cool. Mm -hmm. And then I move on with my life and get right back to my normal plan. Exactly. And that's basically the decision I think you should make. Like, is it very easy to do this? And am I motivated to do it? If so, okay, you can do it. Otherwise, just stick to the plan. Focus on that. Makes sense. Well, hey, this was uh, that was all, all the questions I had for you and a great discussion, a lot of great, great practical advice. I know it's going to be very well received. And we've mentioned the book, the book, the book, but we have not mm -hmm. mentioned the title yet. And I will mention it in the intro, but but a lot of people skip I intros. So why don't you share uh, the, the title and anything you want to say about that? And then let's tell people where they can find you and your work. And if there's anything else you want them to know about, let's wrap up with that. Sure. It's called The Science of Self-Control. And you'll find it on my website, benoensmos.com, uh, along with all the other information on Amazon. You can read uh, a preview of the book for free. And uh, on my website, you'll find a lot more information uh, to see if you uh, may want to purchase it. Um, or just probably also uh, uh, good that there's a free email course where you can just get a little free content and then decide if you want to purchase anything. Uh, other than that, I just hope people enjoyed the call. And uh, I look forward to uh, talk to you again at some point in the future. Same. Thanks again. Well, I hope you liked this episode. I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, subscribe to the show because it makes sure that you don't miss new episodes. And it also helps me because it increases the rankings of the show a little bit, which of course then makes it a little bit more easily found by other people who may like it just as much as you. And if you didn't like something about this episode or about the show in general, or if you have uh, ideas or suggestions or just feedback to share, shoot an email mike at muscleforlife.com muscleforlife.com and let me know what i could do better or just uh what your thoughts are about maybe what you'd like to see me do in the future i read everything myself i'm always looking for new ideas and constructive feedback so thanks again for listening to this episode and i hope to hear from you soon